much for that lavish and characteristically American welcome. <laughs> It is very strange. We don't talk about each other in public that way in the UK. And I have developed various strategies for coping with this, one of which is to remind myself, uh, and my wife hates me telling this story, but she's 5,000 miles away. She need never know that I tell her. <laughs> we were in Australia a few years ago, and I was doing some lectures, and I was on the road for three weeks, and we kept asking for days off, and they kept saying yes, and then adding more things in, and we were both exhausted. And the last day I had done four lectures, rather like I've done today actually, um, but they were just back to back and uh, we were tired out. And uh, at the end of it, people were hanging around and one uh, lady of a certain age, obviously thinking of herself as a fan, came up and was saying something to my host. And the host, thinking to distract her, introduced this lady to my wife. And the woman said, I can't do the Australian accent, but never mind, she said, oh my dear, it must be heaven being married to him. And Maggie said, no, it's hell, actually. <laughs> so, you can believe which story you like, the one you just heard or the one that I'm telling you. But, uh, anyway, I think we've got the air conditioning on. Do I feel some cooler? Well, congratulations to whoever did that. I'll keep my coat on for the moment, if that's all right. Um, in the church season, we are in Eastertide, and in my country, people vaguely know that something vaguely Christian happened at Easter, and I am told that in America, some people still vaguely know that something rather important happened at Easter. You know, there are stories of the Sunday school boy who being asked what happened at Easter. He said, well, that's when Jesus came out of the tomb, and the teacher was about to say, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, and then he said, but if he sees his shadow, he has to go back again. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is misinformation, there's puzzle, there's muddle of all sorts. What is Easter all about? Did it happen? What happened? How do we know? Can we talk about it historically? Can we make sense of it? Is it one of those old fairy tales that, well, just makes some people feel good about this and that to get them through a bad time? Or, or what? What is it all about? That's what I've been asked to speak to you about this evening. And this is an extra problem for us in Western Christianity, as opposed to, say, Greek or Russian Orthodox Christianity. They have other problems, but they don't have this one. But in Western Christianity, we have often thought that the name of the game was, quote, how to go to heaven when you die. And indeed, when I say that, there may well be lots of people in this room who are thinking, and that isn't the name of the game, that isn't what we're all about. Well. The point about heaven for many people is that you leave this world and you leave this body and you go somewhere where you may be like an angel, you may be sitting on a cloud, you may be a disembodied spirit, but you certainly aren't flesh and blood like this and you certainly aren't a robust physical creature in a robust physical world. And so what's the point of a resurrection which is supposedly about somebody who was dead turning out to be very thoroughly alive again? And a lot of our hymns and, and prayers and liturgies, and it, certainly in my tradition, a lot of the liturgies, they actually lead you to the point where you say, yeah, well, we're getting through this life as best we can, and then one day we'll say goodbye to all this, and we'll be in a totally different space, and we'll call it heaven or whatever. And that's simply not what Easter is about. And there's this great confusion abroad. And I think this has happened in our popular culture over the last 200 years in particular. I used to work at Westminster Abbey in central London. And uh, it's a fascinating um, place because so many famous people from British civic life are buried there or have memorials there. And when I worked there, one of the things I noticed going around and taking friends and family around all these interesting and famous people is that the tombstones and the messages on them changed sometime around um, 1800, sometime around then. And before then, people would say on their tombstones things which implied, I am resting at the moment, but I'm going to be back. Uh, the Latin word resurgam occurs, which means I shall arise. I'm coming back. I'm, I'm sleeping at the moment, but I'm going to wake up in a new world. But then in the 19th century, all that changed, and a lot of tombstones ended up just saying, gone home, or at peace at last, or rest and thankful, or something like that. In other words, 
this is the end and I've gone somewhere else and that's the end of the story. And that is a very interesting shift which has happened in our culture and I think in American culture as well and I think actually in America you've bought in perhaps more heavily than we have to the idea that the whole game is about heaven and hell. And if you then start to talk about resurrection, well, why worry? I, I once heard somebody on a phone-in program that I was doing um, phoned up and said, what's the fuss about the body? He said, I'm, I'm an old man, this guy said, and he said, I, I'm going to die soon, and my body's a creaky old thing, it's a real mess, I'm looking forward to get, getting rid of it, and I certainly don't want it back again. And there are many people, you know, most of you here are considerably younger than me, you may not feel like that yet. When you get to my age, you start to feel it a little bit, things start to creak or drop off or whatever, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The question about Easter confronts us because it's actually one of those awkward claims that isn't just a theory, it isn't just like, wouldn't it be nice to believe this, or maybe it's the case that God is really like this or that or whatever. It's about something that is supposed to have happened, supposed to have actually happened in the middle of history. Not in some far-flung mythological sphere, but in a century that we know really rather a lot about, namely the first century of the common era in the Middle East, where we have a lot of documentation, a lot of literature, a lot of stuff, a lot of archaeology that helps us get a handle on what actually happened. And so we have to force the question, is this just something that the Christians made up to keep themselves happy, or is it something that could and did actually happen? And that's really what I'm going to be talking about tonight, is how as a historian, and I was a Roman historian before I was a, a theologian, I did my first degree in ancient history and, and philosophy, and so I'm coming at this first and foremost as a historian of the first century. How do we know about this kind of thing? How can we say anything about what seems to have happened? One of the ways into this, and it's the way I'm going to take tonight, is to begin by asking, what did people, my goodness, they have young undergraduates here these days. <laughs> Excellent, just, just, just keep them happy, that's just fine. <laughs> my, my whole country is wallowing in photographs of little Prince George, who's about that size as well, and we're, we're just delighted with that, so welcome to be, be our guest. Have fun. <laughs> One of the ways into this topic is the whole question of what did people in that world believe about death and what happened after death? Actually, in that world, the world of the first century, there was a wide variety of beliefs about what happens to people after they die. I suspect if you went out on the street here in Phoenix and asked people, what do you think happens to people after they die, there would be actually much less variety than there would have been in the first century. In the ancient pagan world, there were quite a few people who thought that when you die, that's it, your atoms and molecules just dissolve, and everything about you has gone, and that's it. And there were other people in the ancient pagan world who believed that your soul would go to some wonderful place, Plato called it the Isles of the Blessed, where you would engage in lovely, in learned conversation with other philosophical types like yourself. Philosophers who write about this, they always envisage heaven as a bunch of philosophers talking to one another. <laughs> might seem like hell, but still. <laughs> but there are others who thought, in the ancient pagan world, that your soul will be re-embodied in a different body. And so the question is, what would you like to come back as? Will you come back as something else? Will it be another human? Will it be an animal? How will that work? And there are all sorts of other varieties on that. Some people actually think that special people, when they die, become gods or become demigods, uh, so that they actually occupy a place uh, in some pantheon somewhere. So there's, there's a wide, and that's just, this is just for starters, there's a wide variety of things that people believe about what happens after you die. And when you come to the Jewish world, and of course Jesus was a first century Palestinian Jew, and his followers were all first century Palestinian Jews, and when they are talking and writing about what happened to Jesus, they are talking and writing as first century Palestinian Jews. In the Jewish world of Jesus' day, there is still a wide variety of belief about what happens to people after they die. It may surprise you to know that some people in the ancient Jewish world, like some in the ancient pagan world, thought that death was actually the end. 
The Sadducees, who were the aristocrats who ran the temple in Jerusalem, they believed, so far as we know, that there was no meaningful life after death, but this world was where God had called people to be, and this world was where he wanted them to be, and then once they were dead and gone, they had done their job, their time was up. There were other first century Jews who took on some of the Greek views about a disembodied soul going off to a distant heaven. As far as we know, there weren't very many, if any, first century Jews who believed in reincarnation, who believed that uh, the soul would come back in a different body, although there are some hints that some of them may have flirted with that idea. But the mainstream view of most Jews in the time of Jesus, and you can tell this because of their burial customs, burial customs are very interesting indexes of what people believe about life after death, the, the mainstream view was resurrection. What is resurrection? What was it that those people believed? Resurrection, and it's funny, one of these phrases which I've used over the years, and I know people find it difficult, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyway and then explain it. Resurrection is not life after death. Resurrection is life after life after death. When I first typed that and gave it to somebody to, to look at, they said there's a, there's a typo here because you've repeated yourself. And I said, no, that's actually deliberate. That's the point. Because resurrection is not a fancy word for talking about what happens to you immediately after death. Resurrection is a precise term for talking about something that happens after an intermediate period in which you are dead. That is to say, you die bodily, and then at some future date, you will be given a new or resurrected body, and that is after an intermediate period, which is life immediately after death. So there is life, then there is life after death, and then there is life, bodily life, after life after death and that's what resurrection is all about now if you ask people in the ancient world do you believe in resurrection as i say quite a lot of jews would say yes that's what it's all about but interestingly in the ancient pagan world that question is raised and it is always given the answer no it's there in Homer, it's there in the Greek poets. Aeschylus, in a famous tragedy, has somebody say that when a man dies and his blood is spilt on the ground, there is no resurrection. And they tell myths about the possibility of resurrection, but at the end of the day, they know it doesn't happen. Like Orpheus and Eurydice. Uh, Eurydice, Orpheus's wife, dies, she goes down to the underworld. Orpheus is allowed to go down and bring her back but he's not allowed to look back as he's leading her back up the, the long slope. He's not allowed to look back at his beloved, and if he does, she'll be gone. And as he's going up the slope, it becomes too much, and he just has to steal a glance at her, and that's it. She's gone. And that myth is a way of saying we can imagine what it might be like that somebody who has died would come back into bodily life but we know, perhaps sorrowfully, that it's not going to happen. It doesn't happen. Actually, I came not long ago, I came across a feminist version of that myth in which Eurydice, all the way back up, was whispering sweet nothings at her um, erstwhile husband in order to force him to look back because the last thing she wanted was a man in her life again. <laughs> <laughs> you get the picture. Resurrection is not life after death. It's not a fancy way of talking about what happens immediately after death. It's a very precise way of saying something about a future bodily life after a period of being bodily dead. Why did the ancient Jews come to such a bizarre view? when it's blindingly obvious, if you inspect any tomb anywhere, that the body has corrupted and it'll leave bones behind unless they've been burnt or whatever, but that it looks as though there's no chance of any future life. The answer ultimately is that the ancient Jews believed powerfully in the goodness of this created order as a world made by a good God who loved it and who disapproved ultimately of corruption and decay and death because that spoilt his good world and they believed that God would somehow through his great creative power bring a new world and then that all his people who had faithfully followed him would rise from the dead to share in that new world 
And this belief is not right across the pages of the, New, of the Old Testament, anything but. But in the period after the Old Testament and before the New Testament, before the time of Jesus, as more Jews are being killed in persecutions by pagan oppressors of one sort or another, more and more people are saying, if there really is a God, he must do something about this. And when he does, then those who have died in the struggle will be given a new life to share in the new world that he's going to make. In other words, this is all about the view which is there in the Old Testament, that God loves the created world that he's made and he intends to renew it. The earth shall be full, say the prophets, of the glory of the Lord or of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And it doesn't take too much to go on from that and say, if God is going to renew the creation, instead of throwing the creation away as so much trash, God is going to renew it and restore it. And then gradually people say, and maybe when that happens, there will be new bodies as well. And so one of the most important things to say about the, Jew, the ancient Jewish view of resurrection is that it's revolutionary. And I don't just mean revolutionary as an idea that people had the thought of before, but revolutionary in the sense that if you believe in a God who's going to do that, it will strengthen your nerve and your courage to face whatever the world can throw at you, and particularly whatever any pagan or other oppressors may do to you in the meantime. And this is actually why, or perhaps why, the Sadducees, who were the aristocrats, opposed it. When I was younger and I heard that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, I thought, well, obviously they were the liberals, because in my world, it was the liberals who didn't believe in the resurrection. The answer is no, it's because they were the conservatives, and they didn't want anyone rocking the boat of their nice, precious, cozy little world where they were in charge, and where, because when people believe in resurrection, they're likely to do all sorts of things, because they've got their eye on the fact they believe in a God who's going to make his world full of justice and joy and love and beauty. And so anything that we have to suffer in the moment is little in comparison with what God is going to do in the future. So that is the world of the ancient speculations about or beliefs about life after death and life after life after death. So when they say that Jesus was raised from the dead, this is a very specific claim. It's not saying that after Jesus died, well, he went to heaven, isn't that nice, and we'll call it resurrection because that's kind of a fancy word. It's not saying that at all. It's saying that shortly, three days after he was crucified, executed brutally, he was found to be thoroughly bodily alive again. That's the central Christian claim. Before we come back to that, though, I want to sketch something which is really very strange, which is what happened with the early Christians later on, through the first and second century, when they give an account of what they believe about life after death. And here's the thing. I've been in ordained ministry now for 40 years, and though I haven't done as many funerals as some uh, ordained clergy, I have done my fair share. And one of the things you discover about taking funerals, and many of you will have had relatives who died and you've had to help arrange the, the, the event and so on, is that when it comes to that moment in a family's life or in a culture's life, people tend to be very conservative in the sense that they tend to do things the way they've always done them. They tend to want the same as they've seen before because it's a very sad time and, and this is a way of just holding on to things while we get through the sad time. So the beliefs about life after death tend to be fairly consistent transgenerationally across a culture. But here is the extraordinary thing. There are several ways in which, when we ask the earliest Christians what they believe about what happens after death, they say several things which are significantly different from what anyone had said before. And this, as a cultural phenomenon, has to excite the historian. Where does this happen? How do we account for it? What has caused this to come about? Because whether it's St. Paul, who is our earliest Christian writer in the 50s of the 1st century, or whether it's right on at the end of the 2nd century with people like Tertullian and Arrhenius, some of the great Christian teachers 200 years or so after the time of Jesus, they have a remarkably consistent view that when Christians die, their hope is resurrection. 
And the first major difference, and this is obviously a Jewish view, nobody in the ancient pagan world believed that, and most Christians by the end of the second century are not from a Jewish background, they're from a non-Jewish background, but they've all taken on this view. And one of the first differences, though, between what they do and what the Jewish people do is that there is more or less no spectrum of belief about these things. I sketched the spectrum of belief in the pagan world and in the Jewish world, and there just isn't that spectrum in the early Christian world. By the end of the second century, there are some people, we call them Gnostics, the people who have this special kind of knowledge religion, um, and they tend to go with a more platonic view of a disembodied heaven, and some of them call themselves Christians while doing it, but that's really, second half of the second century is the earliest serious evidence for that. And the mainstream is still going with resurrection and no spectrum. And here's a second thing, that whereas in ancient Judaism, the discussion of what happens to people after they die, it's interesting, but it's not central. The ancient Jews have a thousand other things that they regularly talk about. You can look at their literature right across from 200 BC to 400 AD, and resurrection is there, it's one of the topics, but it's not a big issue. If you ask them, they'll say, yeah, we believe that, and the rabbis and so on believe that, but it's not their big central thing. Whereas if you go to early Christianity, resurrection has moved from the periphery to the center. This is absolutely central to what they believe and it motivates who they are and how they go about their daily lives. The third thing which is extraordinary about belief in the resurrection is that the early Christians believed that resurrection had already happened in the case of Jesus and then would happen in the case of all his people. Nothing in pre-Christian Judaism prepares us for this radical departure, this novelty of a split with resurrection mark one and resurrection mark two. That's just not there before, but it's absolutely endemic in early Christianity. And the fourth thing that's different, which is really very interesting the way it works out, is that when the Jewish texts that speak of resurrection hint at what sort of a body there might be for the people who are raised from the dead, they go one of two ways. Some of them talk about the righteous um, who are raised from, from the dead shining like stars in the sky, and some of them just talk about people as though they've come back into exactly the same sort of life as they had before. There are texts which go one way and texts which go the other way. But the early Christian texts, when they talk about the future resurrection which believers can expect, they don't have them shining like stars in the sky, even though Daniel chapter 12 says that. What then? They don't have them being exactly in the same sort of body as they were before. They have them going through death and out the other side into a new sort of embodied existence for which there was no precedent and of which there remains only, at their time, the example of Jesus himself. Because this new bodily existence that they imagine is a bodily existence that has left death behind. It's not that they've gone into death and then taken a step back into the same life as before. That happened to the people who Jesus raised from death during his public career, like Lazarus, for instance, in, in, in John chapter 11. But this is a view of resurrection which is into a transformed physicality, a new sort of body which is no longer subject to decay and suffering and weakness and illness and death. And this has not been articulated before. We don't have that in the Jewish sources, but it's right there in the Christian sources. There are two or three other things which come in as well, which are new in Christianity. One is that the Messiah himself has been raised from the dead. No Jew before the time of Jesus ever thought that the Messiah would be raised from the dead because they didn't envisage the Messiah being killed. So that's, that's a new thing in itself. And then there's another point, which is that already in early Christianity, there's a sense that resurrection is something which has strangely started to happen already. There is a new world in the making, and so that we are not only looking forward to it as a thing in the future, but that we are actually contributing to it somehow in the present. 
That's a, a little complicated, but again, it's something you don't find in pre-Christian Judaism, but when you ask the early Christians about their beliefs, they talk about that future resurrection, but they also talk about inhabiting the new world already, which God is making. So those are several ways in which the belief of the early Christians in what happens to them after they die is at one level on the Jewish map, certainly not on the map of ancient paganism, but at another level significantly different in several clear respects from anything that you find in pre-Christian Judaism. And the historian has to say why, what caused this, what made them develop this very remarkable view. Remember as I say, people believe the things about what happens after death, they tend to believe the things that their parents told them, the things that they learnt, the things that you say in your funeral rituals and so on. And to have such a radical innovation and to have such remarkable unanimity across different Christian cultures from the Middle East through Greece through Rome around the Mediterranean world, different people from different backgrounds all sign up to this. Something has happened to cause this, and what is it that has happened? Now, of course, the early Christians all say, the reason that we believe this, the reason that we know this, the reason we reckon that this is what's going to happen to us, is because of what happened to Jesus himself. And they say, actually, the reason there is anything at all about this Christian faith is because of what happened to Jesus himself. Because, after all, look at it like this. In the history, we know of at least a dozen other messianic or revolutionary or reform movements the century or so either side of Jesus. There were people who thought that they were the Messiah, they were the Lord's anointed, they were going to rescue Israel from the pagan oppressors. There were people who thought that they were prophets, or whose followers thought that they were prophets, and that if people followed them, they would lead them to a better future. And one by one by one, such people, especially the leaders of, of revolutionary movements, of kingdom of God movements, they got picked up by the authorities and they got done away with, sometimes quietly, sometimes brutally. We have the records of that, particularly in the Jewish historian Josephus. What happened to those movements after that occurred? One of two things. If you were a follower of a would-be leader, messiah, king, rebel leader, prophet, whatever, and if your leader got captured and killed, you had a choice. Either you could give up the movement, or you could find yourself another leader. And we have evidence in the sources of some groups who did the one thing and other groups who did the other. And indeed, at one point, there was a, a movement which ran from around the time of Jesus' birth right through to the destruction of the temple by the Romans in AD 70. So uh, two generations at least, and with actually at least three generations of leaders. And each time one of them got killed, they found either a brother or a nephew or a cousin or a grandson or somebody to take it on. Well, that one, we thought he was the leader, but now he's been killed. So here's, here's his son, here's his nephew. This is obviously the person. Why did that happen with the Jesus movement? That too is a teasing historical question. Because look at it like this, who was the great leader of the early church in Jerusalem itself, at the very centre? Who was the one who held things together while Peter and Paul and the others were dashing around the world doing what they had to do? It was this man James, James the brother of the Lord, James the brother of Jesus, a man who was such a great man of prayer that, according to the records, his knees turned out to be callous, like camel's knees, because he spent so long praying for his people and praying for Jerusalem, and praying for God to have mercy. He was a great teacher, a great respected leader. The people in Jerusalem loved him and respected him highly. And he was the brother of Jesus. But nobody ever said that James was the Messiah. They should have done if Jesus had just been executed in the ordinary way. Well, what a shame, but here's his brother. He's a great leader. He's a great teacher. He remembers all that Jesus used to say. Maybe he's the Messiah. No, nobody ever said that. What we have in the records is this picture of a James who wasn't the Messiah. He was known as the brother of the Messiah. 
So, of course, if we ask them, why do you think you're going about things in this way? They say, because on the third day after he was crucified, God raised Jesus from the dead. What does that mean? How do they explain it? Now, there's much I could say about St. Paul's evidence on this. He is the earliest Christian writer. I spent some time earlier today talking to some people, perhaps some of you, about St. Paul, and I'm not going to repeat that, except just for one point, which is really crucial and comes up again and again in discussion. Because when Paul is talking about the future resurrection body, he uses a phrase in his Greek which is regularly translated in terms of a spiritual body. And some of the translations of the New Testament say that the present body is a physical body and the future body will be a spiritual body. But that, in our modern Western language, is deeply, deeply misleading. That is not, the way we hear that is not the way that Paul intended it. Let me explain it like this. The two <coughs> words physical and spiritual, in a sense this is a sidebar because this is not directly related to the argument, but I've found again and again when I've talked to people about this that some people actually know that bit of Paul and they have this question in their minds. So let me just deal with it. The words that Paul uses when he talks about one sort of body and the other sort of body are words which in the Greek do not describe the sort of way that a body is composed, the thing that it consists of. What they do is they describe the thing that is animating that body. And the distinction Paul is making there is between the present body, which is animated by the ordinary human existence. You can call it a soul if you like. But in the Bible, the word soul is a very loose word and just means the inner dynamic which all humans have, or something like that. So the present body is a body animated by the ordinary human soul, but the future body is a body which will be animated by the spirit. And Paul elsewhere talks about God's own spirit giving new life to our mortal bodies at that future date, life after life after death. So when Paul talks about the two sorts of body, he isn't saying that the present body is in our sense physical and the future body is in our sense spiritual, i.e. non-physical. What he's saying is that the present body is animated by the ordinary human inner life and the future body will be animated by and indeed raised by the spirit. So what do we have to say happened? Well, of course, as I say, all the early Christians say with one voice, God raised Jesus from the dead. And I know well enough, because in my discipline and out there in the popular sphere as well, people say, yeah, yeah, we know what happened really. It was that the disciples were so struck and stunned and horrified by Jesus' death that they couldn't come to terms with it. And they made up this kind of rumor that maybe he's still alive or that maybe they felt his presence with them. Or, or, or maybe they had a sense that God still was carrying forward the cause for which Jesus had lived and taught, and that maybe uh, that they had to go on believing this, and then gradually, bit by bit, they started to express that in terms of resurrection, and then finally, maybe two generations later, some scholars have suggested this, people started to make up stories about finding an empty tomb which weren't there in the early tradition. Well, to go back to the whole business of what in the trade is called cognitive dissonance, when people want, some, want something so badly to be true, that when it isn't true, they can't cope with it and they make up stories about it. Again, think of those movements, those Jewish revolutionary movements. Think of one in particular which focuses it rather sharply, because we have a great deal of evidence from the historian Josephus about one of the messiahs of the war period, that's the war between the Jews and the Romans, 66 to 70 AD. And there was one particular character who was picked up by the Romans as they took the temple, um, uh, Simon bar Giora, his name was, and they took him back to Rome and they said, here is the king of the Jews, and they had their great triumphal procession, if you 
you've been to Rome, you've probably seen the Arch of Titus, when the emperor, the man who became the emperor Titus, had a triumph and celebrated his victory over uh, the, the Jews and over Jerusalem. And Simon was dragged along at the back of the procession and was ceremonially and ritually executed at the end of it. That's what they did to people in those circumstances. Now, supposing you had been one of Simon's followers, one of his friends, and supposing somehow you'd managed to give the Roman guards the slip, and you'd managed to get away and hide, and then you realized that he'd been killed, and so you're in shock, and you're in grief, and you're in fear, and you're in hiding, and supposing some of you, because you're devout Jews, are saying your prayers, and reading the Psalms, and weeping, and praying some more, and then somebody in the group says, I think he's been raised from the dead. And somebody else says, what do you mean you think he's been raised from the dead? You saw that he was killed. What are you talking about? They say, well, no, I don't mean he's been literally raised from the dead. I mean, I, I have a sense that he's somehow with us. I have a sense that God really loved him and that God was pleased that we followed him. These are all things that people have said about Jesus' disciples to explain why they said what they did. But it makes no sense. Imagine that little group of hypothetical followers of Simon bar They would say to anyone saying that, Okay, if you have a sense that God still loves us, then say a prayer, sing a psalm, do something. We have plenty of songs and so on to say that. But don't say he's been raised from the dead, because that's a very specific claim, and he obviously hasn't been. And so uh, it, the, the, the idea of resurrection is not something that you would stumble upon in that world. When you think about real first century history, rather than just fantasy, it simply doesn't make sense. But what about the Gospel records themselves? In Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we have records which are fascinating, which are tantalizingly brief, which don't sit very comfortably with one another, so that even when they're telling the same story, they don't use the same words. And, and people have looked at them and thought, well, what is going on here? What sort of stories are these? And many people have said, well, they must be made up later, because uh, clearly, um, we, we know that nothing can have actually happened, so obviously somebody's written them up later to express the belief which was gradually coming through. And there are several indications, actually, that those stories in the four Gospels and the beginning of Acts, even though they may be edited by the people who wrote those Gospels, which we assume is sometime between the 60s and the 80s or even the 90s, there's evidence that even though they were edited at that stage, the stories themselves have not changed that much from how they must have been in the very, very early period. The first piece of evidence is very striking, and that is in that all the stories, the women take the leading role. Now, I'm sorry, but this is just the way the ancient world was. Women in the ancient world, Jewish or pagan, were not regarded as credible witnesses in a law court or in any such situation. So much so that when we get the official version of the church's teaching, which we find in one of Paul's letters, when he tells the story, which is the kind of agreed version that they've all squared away between them, the women have disappeared. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, this is the story we tell the Messiah died, was buried, raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and was seen by, and he lists, one person after another, Peter, James, 500 all at once, the 12 apostles, and then last of all to Paul himself. Now, among the 500, there may have been women, but those of us who know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John want to say, excuse me, what about Mary Magdalene? Excuse me, what about the other Mary? What about Joanna? What about these women who in all the other records were there at the tomb? And the answer is, because this tradition has been developed in order to address a skeptical, hostile, pagan world, the women, sadly, have been airbrushed out of the church's official tradition at that point. But they're all still there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it is historically incredible that those would have been made up after that official tradition that Paul records in 1 Corinthians 15. So the place of the women in the stories is a very strong sign that even though the stories were likely edited later, they go back to very early tradition. The second feature which takes us in that same direction 
is the use of scripture, of the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament as Christians came to call them, in these resurrection stories. St. Paul says that the Messiah rose from the dead in accordance with the scriptures. And in Paul's writings, and in Peter and elsewhere in the New Testament, we see them interpreting the story of the resurrection in the light of the Old Testament scriptures. But where are the Old Testament scriptures in the resurrection narratives themselves? This is very interesting because when you look at the crucifixion narratives, the stories immediately before Jesus' resurrection, when they're talking about Jesus being mocked and whipped and beaten and nailed to a cross and then hanging there for hour after hour until he finally dies an agonizing death, the way that the early church tell the stories and the way that that has come through into the crucifixion narrative is woven together with reflections from the Jewish scriptures, from the Psalms and the prophets. So much so that some scholars have suggested that actually the early church didn't know very much about how Jesus was precisely crucified and they've made up the whole thing from bits and pieces of Old Testament prophecy. I find that very far-fetched, but it explains that, yes, in the crucifixion stories, the Old Testament is very important. Now, they all believed that the resurrection took place in fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, but the stories don't have the Old Testament woven into them in the way that the crucifixion stories do. This is the more interesting because already in Paul, in the 50s, when he writes about the resurrection, he draws on the Psalms, he draws on Genesis, he draws on Daniel, draws on Ezekiel, draws on Isaiah, in order to show the full meaning of what's going on. But the stories as we have them in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they have tiny little hints of scriptural allusions, but basically almost nothing. And in the early church, because they were soaked in the scriptures, they did tell their stories in the way that made it clear that these were fulfilling, were fulfilling the scriptures. But when they retold and retold and retold the story of Jesus' resurrection, these stories have the feeling of something which is fresh and pre-reflective. These have not been worked over with layer upon layer of theological and biblical interpretation. These are stories told almost breathlessly with excitement, as though they can't quite believe what's going on. One famous scholar who I know quite well, Ed Sanders, who was a colleague of mine in Oxford, in one of his books about Jesus, he says that the resurrection stories look very much as though the people who tell them are saying, I, I know this sounds crazy, but this is just how it was, because we know that this sort of thing doesn't happen. And so we are just breathlessly trying to blurt out what we found to be the case. A further very odd feature about those resurrection stories is that whereas elsewhere in the New Testament, every time you get somebody talking about Jesus' resurrection, you get them talking also about our own resurrection. That's natural. Jesus was raised. We belong to Jesus. Therefore, we will be raised. And to this day, I don't know how many of you were in church eight days ago on Easter Day, but I bet many of the Easter sermons that were preached in this city, in my town, all over the place, were saying, in effect, Jesus has been raised from the dead, therefore we will be raised from the dead. The fascinating thing is that neither Matthew, nor Mark, nor Luke, nor John says that in their resurrection stories. Clearly they all believe that. But at this point, the stories are not concerned to say what will happen to us after our death. The stories are about, oh my goodness, he's back, he's been raised, <laughs> and therefore God's new world has begun, and therefore he really was the Messiah after all, and therefore we have a job to do. That's how the stories work. They aren't... He was raised from the dead, therefore what's our life after life after death going to be like? Those, they are saying, he was raised from the dead, therefore something huge and new has been born. The world has turned its crucial, critical corner, and Jesus, instead of being a failed Messiah, turns out to be Israel's Messiah and the world's true Lord after all. That's how the stories work. And again I put it to you that if they'd been written up, or cobbled together 40, 50, 60 years later, as many people have suggested, 
It would have been only too natural, granted the way the whole of the rest of early Christian thought went, for people to say, for some one of the bystanders to say something about, well, he's been raised, therefore we will be as well, but they don't. And then a very strange thing, a very strange feature of these stories. As I said, in the Jewish world, when they talk about the future resurrection of God's people, they go one of two ways. Either they have these raised people shining like stars in the sky, like it says in Daniel chapter 12, or they have them simply coming back into exactly the same sort of life as they had before. And as I said, the early Christians, when they talk about their own resurrection, they seem to be talking about a transformed physicality, a new kind of incorruptible physicality. Now here's the strange thing about the portrait of Jesus in those stories in the Gospels. That Jesus in the stories in the Gospels, the resurrection stories in the Gospels, does not shine. They don't say that Mary Magdalene or Peter or James or whoever saw Jesus coming and, and his face was shining like the sun. Uh, later on, John on the Isle of Patmos has a vision of Jesus with his face shining like the sun, but that doesn't occur in any of the four gospel narratives or at the beginning of Acts either. So is Jesus just like he was before? Well, no, he isn't. And this is really, really odd. And again, it's the sort of thing that if you were making up the stories later, I just don't see you'd have done this. The, to begin with, and it isn't just that their eyes are blinded by tears or whatever, one person after another doesn't immediately recognize him. Mary thinks he's the gardener until he speaks to her. And then very strangely, when he meets the disciples by the lake in John chapter 21, they see him standing on the shore, and they come into shore having caught their fish, and there he is cooking breakfast by the shore. And John says this very strange line, he says, none of them dared ask him, who are you? because they knew it was the Lord. And I've read that many times. I have a friend who's set that to music. It's a very strange line. Because, face it, they've been with this man day and night, close up, uh, intimate friends, for the last two or three years. And, and you know, if, if, if some of you I've only just got to know, one or two I may know a little bit better, but if I didn't see you for a couple of days and then I saw you again, I wouldn't think of asking, who are you? I'd say, oh, it's you again. Hi, good to see you. <laughs> none of them dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. There is a sense that he is the same and yet different. Something has changed. And of course, the really strange thing is that this body which Jesus has seems to have new, unprecedented properties. It comes and goes through locked doors. And people say, oh, well, it's a ghost. It's a fantasy. Actually, you know, they knew about ghosts, they knew about fantasies, they knew about visions. I'll come back to that in a moment. But then, the same stories which tell us about Jesus coming and going and appearing and disappearing also have him breaking bread in a house, also have him eating and even cooking fish, so that the stories are at the same time um, really rather dramatically physical and rather dramatically what you might call transphysical. And this is where Ed Sanders' point comes in again. It looks as though they are desperately trying to tell us something that they really had experienced for which they don't really have very good language themselves. And it's then left to the rest of the Christian church to stand and stare at this in awe and say, what on earth is going on here? And that's when, being Jews as opposed to pagans, they come back to the idea that actually in God's good creation, the things we call heaven and earth, the twin spheres of God's good creation, were always made to work together. And it looks as though the person they call Jesus now inhabits both of them simultaneously in a way which was totally unprecedented, but which is a sign of what God intends to do in the end which is to bring heaven and earth together. Because that, my friends, is the Christian hope that they articulate. Not that we will leave earth and go to heaven, but that as Jesus taught his followers to pray, that God's kingdom would come on earth as in heaven. And that's indeed the last scene of the Bible, is the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth. 
So what did they really say that happened? Now there are two things here. And again, scholars have puzzled about whether one of them was original and the other was added in later or whatever. One of them is the empty tomb. The other one is appearances of Jesus. That Jesus appeared to people, they saw him, they touched him, they ate with him, etc. And at the same time, the tomb was empty. Now, if you think about this historically, those two stories, those two sets of evidences need one another to mean anything significant. If you know anything about the ancient world and burial customs and so on, grave robbery was quite common. There are even novels from the first century, Hellenistic novels, which talk about grave robbery. Especially when somebody famous or possibly royal was being buried, often thieves would think, aha, I bet they buried some nice jewels with that person. Let's just go and have a look and see. And so tomb robbery was quite common. So finding an empty tomb may be very distressing, but by itself, it means nothing except something very sad and dark has occurred. That's why in John's Gospel, Mary Magdalene thinks somebody's obviously removed the body and that that just makes life worse. It doesn't mean, oh wow, there's an empty tomb, therefore he's been raised from the dead. And likewise, the appearances of Jesus are very interesting because we know from both ancient sources and modern sources that people who have died do sometimes appear to other people, to their friends or people that they've known, often in quite a different part of town or part of the country. I've had an example of this in my own family. After my father-in-law died, he actually appeared in the room of a close family friend who didn't know that he died. Suddenly there he was looking very fit and well and smiling and then disappeared again. And the friend told my mother-in-law about this uh, a day or two later with sort of, she, he didn't have any categories to put this event in. And very tragically, and I'm going to see the person who, to whom this happened in the next few days in Pasadena when I'm over there, uh, an old friend of mine had a daughter who was uh, killed in a random shooting incident um, in Texas. And her fiancé, who lived in California, found that suddenly she appeared in his room in California, um, smiling at him, and just briefly, and then disappeared again. He had no idea that she'd just been killed. And this, this does happen, there's a literature about it, and they knew just as much about it in the ancient world as we do in the modern. We have literature about that too. There's an example in the book of Acts, when Peter is in jail and he's going to be killed the next day, and the church is praying for him, and somehow, miraculously, he gets out of jail and he comes and knocks on the door of the house where the church is praying and their prayer is so faithful and so full of hope that they can't believe it's him. And when the little maid comes and says, it's Peter, it's Peter, they say it must be his angel, which is their way of saying it's one of those fantasies. He's obviously been killed in the prison and that's very sad and he's, as it were, come to say goodbye. They didn't really have much metaphysical categories for coping with that any more than we do. I have no idea how that stuff happens. I merely observe that in cases that I know close up second hand, it does happen and it did in that world. So all I'm saying is, if you have brief appearances of somebody who has recently died, that doesn't mean they must be alive again. It means, well that's very strange, but of course he's dead. That's actually confirming that he's dead not that he's alive. It's only when you get the appearances and the empty tomb together and then consistently that over the following period of time that you start to say he really is alive, he really is raised from the dead and you say it in a way which you can then stand up and say it to outsiders as well. So for my money the only explanation which will do and I've studied most of the other explanations like the women went to the wrong tomb or it was early in the morning and Jesus' brother showed up and he looked a bit like Jesus so they thought it was him, etc, etc. All of these, you only have to poke and prod at them a little bit and they turn out to be historically far less plausible. And so it seems to me that from a historical point of view, the best explanation would be to say that Jesus really was alive again in a transformed physicality for which there had been no precedent and of which there remains no subsequent example. 
But of course, in order to say that, you have to take a very big step and actually take off your normal worldview spectacles which say that this sort of thing can't happen and either clean them up or replace the lens or something. Because I'm not saying to you that I can argue rationally from all this first century evidence to say that therefore either you must believe in the bodily resurrection or you're just stupid. But what I can say, and people sometimes imagine that that's what Christian apologists do say, maybe some Christian apologists do, but I wouldn't. What I will say is, actually, what history teaches me is that all other explanations for the rise of early Christianity turn out to be far less plausible, which poses the question, which is the Jewish question, the biblical question, is there, after all, a God who, having made this world, wants to renew it? A God who, having made this world and loved this world, wants to rescue it from corruption and decay? And might it actually, after all, be true that Jesus was the bearer of the love and purpose of this God, bearing this purpose in person to the cross where he took the full force of corruption, decay, and evil onto himself? Might it after all be the case that Jesus really was the one who burst through into the new creation and thereby launched God's kingdom on earth as in heaven? And as you contemplate that possibility and then look at the history, then you find yourself in a different place. You find yourself being offered some new lenses for your worldview spectacles. The way that I've sometimes expressed it is this, it's an old illustration which I've used before and some of you may have seen it in one or other of my books and I still find it helpful and here we are in a university setting which is where the illustration originated. I saw today in the Fuller Seminary uh, some wonderful artwork, seven paintings which someone has done, a multimedia presentation uh, paintings of the seven days of creation. Supposing somebody gave to this university a wonderful, spectacular painting, a tremendous, huge canvas which was stunning and beautiful and amazing and just you couldn't imagine anything more beautiful. And supposing then the committee, and universities always have committees to look at this sort of thing, they said to themselves, where are we going to put this? It won't go in the great lecture room, it won't go in the hall, it won't go in the dining hall if you have one, it won't go in the sports pavilion. We haven't got anywhere that will house this great gift. And supposing then, finally they said, this is such an amazing work of art that the best and most responsible thing to do is in fear and trembling to dismantle some of our key buildings and redesign them around this great gift that we have been given. And that's perhaps a little implausible, but then to make the analogy work even better, you would have to go one stage further and to say that when you did this and put this great gift in the middle of your whole campus and redesign things around it, then all sorts of things which had been not quite working right and not quite sorted out in the campus the way it had been, actually started to work better, started to make more sense. That's the sort of thing that happens with the resurrection. The resurrection will not fit into the worldview that any of us have. This is nothing to do with being ancient or modern, by the way. I was on a television program a few years ago with a learned German scholar who had given up his Christian faith and given up belief in the resurrection, given up belief in Jesus. And he said at one point, he said, we know that the body of Jesus has molded in the tomb. And I said, how do you know that? He said, I have 200 years of scientific historiography on my side. I said, you have 200 years, excuse me. Plato knew that the dead don't rise. Seneca knew that the dead don't rise. Homer knew that. Cicero knew that. This is not something new. There is this myth abroad in the post-enlightenment world that everything that went before 1750 was just superstition and people didn't know the laws of nature. <laughs> just stupid. Uh, as C.S. Lewis said um, uh, uh, about, about Mary's pregnancy, about the virgin birth, the reason that Joseph was worried about Mary's pregnancy was not because he didn't know where babies came from, but because he did. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same with the bodily resurrection. They knew perfectly well that this doesn't happen. But faced with the stories of Jesus' resurrection, the challenge then is, what would happen if you took this amazing work of art called resurrection, 
the resurrection of the one who had died on the cross to sum up all God's love and purposes for the human race. What would happen if you put that work of art into the middle of your worldview and then tried to rebuild everything around it? That is the challenge of the Christian gospel. And the challenge doesn't come purely in an intellectual bracket, although I've been arguing it moderately intellectually tonight. It comes in terms of practice. It comes in terms of all the things about your life that maybe are contributing towards the sorrow and sadness and corruption and decay of your own life and of the world. And all the things that you long for, which actually will require new creation, resurrection, redemption, new birth, new possibilities. When you put the resurrection of Jesus into the middle of that picture of your life, of your world, of our world, of our world which actually is still running around like headless chickens so often, trying to figure out what to do, what would happen if we cleaned up our worldview spectacles and put the resurrection right into the middle? That is the challenge. That is the challenge. Because with the resurrection, the early Christians believed God's kingdom had come in a totally unexpected fashion on earth as in heaven. And Jesus himself, the risen one, says, and one of the interesting things is the gospel stories don't actually finish. They sort, there's a sort of semicolon at the end. Jesus says, forget all that stuff that's behind. Now it's time to come and follow me. That is the challenge of the resurrection in history, in faith and in real life. Thank you very much. Wow. take them as they go and so we go for so the first one was there ever a time you doubted the resurrection or feared that it was not true what happened i'm one of those odd people that actually grew up in a christian home and i've never had uh, an atheist period as it were but um there are other sorts of doubt than intellectual doubt there's what i could call moral doubt which afflicts many of us i think which is to say yeah i believe it with my head but actually I'm having a hard time living it out. Because the Christian moral life is a life of dying to sin and rising again with Jesus. Paul talks about that quite explicitly. And there are many times in my life where though with my head I have not doubted the resurrection of Jesus, with my behavior I have behaved as if I doubted it. So there is, I think there's different kinds of doubt there and certainly I've often suffered from the latter. What do you make of the uh, problems of people recognizing or not recognizing Jesus after the resurrection? Well, that, that as I say, is, is one of the fascinating elements in the story, which, you know, face it, if you're making up these stories in, say, 65 or 85 AD or whenever you think the stories might have been made up, you wouldn't do it like that. You know, the idea that they would say, who are you, or that they would want to say, who are you, but were a bit shy to, that's just a very odd thing. That, to me, says that these stories have the ring of truth. Um, this is not the sort of thing that somebody would have, would have invented. And so the only way I can get at that is by saying that if it is true that Jesus did not just come back into the same sort of physical life that he'd had before, i.e. a body that was capable of corrupting and decaying and getting sick and being beaten and dying, but had gone through death and out the other side into a new sort of physicality, then it is comprehensible that there might be some sense of difference. It's like, I suppose, one illustration you could use is if somebody that you know has been sick for a long time and has been emaciated and, and not well and so on, and then quite suddenly they are cured and you meet them a few days later and they look the picture of health, you might sort of stare at them, is it really you? And it seems to me that something like that is good. They've just seen this man crucified. And now here he is, full of life. And, and, and you know, there's, there's understandably a moment of, of, of surprise. How does, uh, how does 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10 fit in with your concept of immediate state? And you may have to tell us a little about 2 Corinthians. 
Corinthians 5. Yeah, chapter. Um, 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians after a time when he faced a huge period of suffering. He talks about it in terms that today we would call it a nervous breakdown. He says, I, I despaired of life itself. Um, you know, if there are counsellors and therapists among you, if somebody says that, you know this is quite a serious moment. And Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 how he has, as it were, clawed his way back into mental health, into hope and stability again, by clinging on to the resurrection of Jesus and the promise of resurrection. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 10, he talks then about the future hope and talks about there being a, a, a tent, a tabernacle, which is, you know, the Jews talked about the tent, the tabernacle, the temple as the dwelling place of God, and they used the same language as a dwelling place for ourselves. And what he says there is we have um, a, a, a new body, a new tabernacle waiting for us, ready to be put on, to be put on on top of the present one. He says, because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be more fully clothed. This is strange language to many of us, but actually if we think about it, and some Christian theologians have developed this, we wear clothes not just because we want to decorate ourselves, but in a sense we all know in our bones that we are made for something more than this. Clothes are a way of anticipating the resurrection body. That's a, it's a very, maybe a very strange idea there. But what he's, what he's talking about then is the possibility of an intermediate state in which you will have to do without a body. But he says, I am longing for the final state when I'll get the new one. And this is where, adapting the analogy of the person who's been very sick, he talks about the new body being put on top. And this is a wonderful, exciting idea that there is a real you. There is you the way that God sees you. There is you the way that God wants you to be. And that is the new you that is waiting, which is more like you than you could imagine you being, if you see what I mean. It's a real wonderful you, uniquely you. You know, the thing about sin and death is it reduces us all just to carbon copies of one another. It's all very boring. But in God's creation, we're designed each to be radically different from one another and more different yet. And in the new body, that's what it'll be. So Paul is envisaging that, yes, there may be an intermediate time, but actually the crucial thing is the new body that we're going to be given. Mm -hmm. uh, I have written about this at some length, predictably, in um, my book, The Resurrection of the Son of God. So if anyone wants to check it out there, they can do that. Well, what do we miss if we see the resurrection as only a metaphor? <laughs> I, um, sorry, it reminds me of a, of a wonderful cartoon I saw some years ago. Of a, it's when I was practicing as bishop, and I, it's the cartoon of a bishop visiting a convent, and one of the nuns saying plaintively to the to the bishop, uh, "We seem to have death watch beetle in the chapel roof." And the bishop saying, it may help to think of it as a metaphor. The trick here is that in the Old Testament, there is one time when the resurrection is used as a metaphor. That's in Ezekiel chapter 37, where it's an image for the restoration of Israel. The Valley of Dry Bones is a picture of Israel in exile, and the dry bones come to life, and that's a picture of the restoration from exile. Fine, okay. What then happens in the New Testament is that the metaphor comes to life, and then it develops new metaphorical meanings in terms of holiness, for instance, as in Romans 6, or in other ways when um, Paul says, awake sleeper and rise from the dead and Christ will give you light. So it generates new metaphors, but it generates those because it is something that actually happened. It's not just an idea. So that we have to be very careful about this because people talk about the literal and the metaphorical and that language gets very slippery in our discourse these days. But actually the whole point about the New Testament is that it's not simply a set of ideas. It's not simply a pretty way of talking about how I feel inside or something like that. That is a big step towards Gnosticism again. The New Testament is about something that actually happens in real history to real humans with real bodies in the real world. And if you say it's just a metaphor, what you're saying is, I don't actually like the look of genuine New Testament Christianity. I prefer something more like 
Gnosticism and private spirituality. Fine, there's a lot of that about, but it's not the same thing. What happens, what happens to the soul between death and resurrection? What happens to the soul between death and resurrection? Um, first thing to say is that the New Testament doesn't actually use the word soul to describe that continuity between death and resurrection. It's important to be clear about this, because if you believe in resurrection, in life after life after death, then you have to believe in some kind of continuity between the body that then dies and some sort of new embodiment which you'll be given in resurrection. How you describe that continuity is very problematic. And the first century Jews struggled with that as well. There is one famous passage in the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 3, which is in what, we, what Christians call the Apocrypha, written probably in the early years of the first century, though we're not sure about that. And in that passage it says, the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and there shall no torment touch them. And then a few verses later it says, that at the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and run like sparks through the stubble, and the Lord will set them over nations and kingdoms. This is a picture of a temporary disembodied soul with God looking after it, and then when God does the new creation that he's going to do, setting these people, um, giving them a new life, a new body, um, setting them in authority over the world. So that text does use the idea of the soul as the vehicle of this intermediate state. But be careful, because the word soul is used in Greek philosophy, some Greek philosophy, not all, as a way of talking about an inherently immortal part of every human being, which probably pre-existed our conception and will go on existing to all eternity, come what may. That's an idea you find in Plato, emphatically not in the New Testament. The word soul in the New Testament is a question mark. It's a, it's a signpost. It's a way of saying there is a sense of who I am. We might call it the personality or something like that. But it doesn't carry those particular metaphysical connotations. The other ways that the rabbis or the, the Pharisees talked about that continuity was in terms of angel or spirit. I mentioned Peter, angel, and the saying in the house, it must be his angel. In other words, a soul or something, a non-bodily visitation anyway. And so they are, they are feeling their way towards expressing something. Um, but this is frustrating because, as pastors among you will know, if you take a funeral or if you visit a family who've been bereaved, one of the questions they always ask is, what I want to know is, where is he now? Where is she now? What's what can I think about them? And that's difficult because the New Testament doesn't say very much about that. Jesus says to the brigand who is crucified beside him in Luke 23, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is not an ultimate destination. It is the blissful garden where you go to be refreshed before the final day. As we know, today, Good Friday, but Jesus rose on Easter day. So paradise is the intermediate. It's, it's a word for the intermediate state. All our language about the future is a set of signposts pointing into a fog. They are not accurate descriptions of what we find. They're a way of saying, it'll be okay. God has something good for you. Paul says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So there are just a few hints in the New Testament which say, trust God. You will be okay. God will look after you. My friend and uh, former colleague, John Polkinghorne of Cambridge, has a modern metaphor. He says, God will download our software onto his hardware until he gives us new hardware to run the software again for us. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's just a way of saying soul and body without actually saying that. <laughs> How did the assumptions of Elijah and Enoch fit into your understanding of Um Nobody quite knows what even the writers of the stories had in mind. These are two great figures in the Old Testament. One in the very early prehistory of Israel and of the human race, Enoch. And it says Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And legends developed about Enoch being taken up to heaven. And then the prophet Elijah, who belongs in probably 8th century history, or the Old Testament especially, is that about right? 9th, 8th, it will take. Um, the story is that he was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. 
And uh, again, how does that fit? Well, it's a way of saying he died, but there was something special about his death, or maybe he passed through death in a different way. That's as much a puzzle for the biblical writers as it is for us. And that's the sort of point where I just say, um, God can do whatever God wants to do. Um, that doesn't seem to be something which I need to fit in in a kind of neat logical way. Maybe there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in any of our philosophies, but um, they are never cited as examples of what anyone subsequently should expect to happen to them. They are very odd one-offs, if that. Matthew 27, 52, 53 refers to the bodies of saints raised after Jesus' resurrection. Were these resurrected bodies? Yeah, that's a very odd passage in Matthew 27. And uh, some of the early church fathers actually believed that those people who were raised at the same time as Jesus' resurrection, uh, that this was a genuine resurrection for them too, in the sense that they had gone through death and up out the other side into an immortal physicality. And some of the church fathers refer to them as being still alive and living in Jerusalem in their own day, um, you know, a long, long time later. Uh, I think had that had anyone believed that that was the case, Paul could not have said what he does in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says that Christ has been raised ahead of everybody else and then when he comes again, all his people will be raised. I think if there had been a bunch of a dozen or two who had been raised at the same time, Paul might have had to make an exception for them and he doesn't. So it's as though, and this is an important point, and people debate whether Matthew meant that in a metaphorical sense uh, as a sort of vivid way of saying it was a cosmic earthquake or something. But that um, the early Christians clearly did believe that when Jesus came out of the tomb on Easter morning, there was, as it were, a shock wave which went through the whole creation. Because new creation had been born. And it's as though the whole world then knew in its bones that something new was afoot, even though it mightn't be able to say what it was. And Paul talks about that in Colossians. So I don't have a great theory about even what Matthew thought had actually happened. But it does seem to me that this was not, if, if, if something like that happened, it, does, it seems to me that was not the same sort of event as Jesus' own resurrection. It may have been like the raising of Lazarus or something, that somebody who then... Um, had to go and lie down again, like the um, like the spirits in Gilbert and Sullivan's running Bull. When when uh, morning comes, they've got to go back again. I, I don't know. Um, it's one of those bewildering things, and it's fine. I'm perfectly happy to have new sense like that lying around. I don't have to tie more. Them, but, uh, Where in the Old Testament do you find clear expectation of individual resurrection or resurrection? In the Old Testament, I've mentioned Ezekiel 37, and I think that Ezekiel was Ezekiel 37 is originally a prophetic symbol or metaphor. That's the Valley of the Dry Bones. There are some passages like in the Psalms, like Psalm 16, like Psalm 73, which seem to hint at a new sort of life. You will not leave my soul in Hades. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. That's Psalm 16, which is quoted by Peter in Acts 2, saying that, well, David wrote that a long time ago, and he died, and his body corrupted, but now that was a prophecy of Jesus, who is David's um, successor, and he did not see corruption. Um, perhaps the most obvious passages then are Hosea 6, where you get, on the third day he will raise us up, and again, people debate was that actually resurrection, is it a metaphor? But then more specifically, Daniel chapter 12, which I've mentioned a couple of times, where the righteous who have died, who have been martyred, will be raised to life and shine like stars in the sky. And again, whether Daniel means that metaphorically, Daniel is full of prophetic symbol and imagery. So those are the, those are the places. But I wouldn't myself go to specific passages predicting this or that, I would go back to the whole Old Testament sense that when God made the world, he made it good, and God grieves over the world which he loves and wants to restore it. And since humans are the kind of linchpin of God's world, the way that God sees it, then God wants to restore humans as well. And this is a much bigger theme than just one or two proof texts in Hosea or Daniel or Ezekiel or whatever. It's then in the later literature, like Second Maccabees, and as I say, Wisdom of Solomon and so on, that you get more explicit mention of, of the righteous being raised. 
not sure if you're aware of this film, but what is your view of the movie Heaven is for Real? <laughs> Sadly, I don't know the film. No, um, I, I, my wife is a movie goer in our family. Um, I don't think even she's seen that. Last question. Would a loving God who wants to restore all creation really send a son to die for just a chosen people? Wouldn't it seem to be more in God's character to redeem everyone and everything? Um, it's always difficult to say that we know ahead of time what God would do. That would mean that we were God, sort of, or that we were able to kind of um, design a, a job description for God. And whenever humans try to do that, they tend to trip over their feet. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that one of the primal features of human sin is to put the knowledge of good and evil before the knowledge of God. That's his analysis of, of Genesis 3. So that it's always risky to say, we can see what a good God ought to do. So come on, God, you better shape up. And if your book says something different, then we'll, we'll just sort of ignore that bit. Um, I think the way the question is formed, and I understand how, how and why it's formed, seems to presuppose this really very Western Christian view, or some bits of Western Christian view, that there is a rather small number of the saved, and that that's why Jesus came to save them. Whereas, in fact, the New Testament is all about God's desire to rescue the whole creation, and that the reason God saves humans is in order that through these humans, his project for his whole creation can be taken forward. We have made this, we have turned it back in on itself, which is always a very dangerous thing to do, as though God saves humans away from the world. No, God wants to put the whole world right, mm -hmm. so he puts us right in order that we can be putting right people for the world. And if you stop and say, how many people get in and how many people are left out. That's missing the point. That's the wrong way of asking the question. And as soon as you ask the question the wrong way, you get into precisely this kind of dilemma. Because in the New Testament, it's very clear that part of the deal is that the humans, through whom God wants to take forward his purpose in and for the world, those humans are not puppets. They are not automata. God isn't pulling their strings. God wants them to be free, loving, wise, mature human beings with whom he can have a wonderful relationship, but through whom he can then act in the world. And that means that people are free and continue to be free to say, no, thanks, I don't want to be reshaped according to your plan because it'll mess up my own view of my life. And so I believe that God grieves over that, but I believe it is a reality. I believe that people do have the freedom uh, to, to, to refuse to participate in God's project of new creation. That's the way I would put it. It seems to me as soon as we turn it back on ourselves and say some others question mark, then we're actually bound to be talking nonsense fairly soon if we're not there. Yeah. speak good news to the people around us 
uh, friends and strangers, that we as a people group would be a good news people. Mm -hmm. Thank you that you are a God who has a heart for good news, and you've demonstrated that most clearly through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Lord, it's in your Son's name that we pray all of these things, and it's in your Spirit we pray with power. And we bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. To you be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 We're not going to keep Tom right long because he's got more speaking, so I'm sure many of you all like to meet him, but we're not going to give you that opportunity. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for coming.